uh, land, which is the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. Uh, may we all live in peace as people of the treaty. Thank you very much and a very, very warm welcome to you all. So thank you for joining us. It's always so good to see so many regulars come back for more. So that's great. So my name is Perm Jock Valier. I hope I pronounced that properly. And as you can tell from my accent, I am from indeed Dartmouth, Nova Scotia. And today we're going to talk about language. And I'm also on this thing called Twitter, which some former heads of states aren't allowed on. So that's one thing I have, which I don't share in common with other famous people. So if you want to follow me on Twitter, feel free to do so, or you could just talk to me. Uh, and I'm very, very accessible. And if you do have, Erin, thank you very, very much for the warm introduction. Thank you very much to our planet, uh, to our partners uh, who have made this possible, Volta, Planet Hatch, and of course, Ignite and Idea Hub. Thank you, thank you, thank you. This would not be possible without them, and it's free because of them. So thank you very much indeed. So we're going to talk about language. Let's begin with a definition, because everybody uses language, but we often get confused with what do we mean by language? And this is a definition. It's weird using language to define language, but there we go. It is the method of human communication, either spoken or written consisting of the use of words, and this is the important things to all those lawyers and tech people out there, in a structured and conventional way. In a structured and conventional way. So really think about language. Now, as you probably are aware, this is the first of a series of three. Today, we're gonna to focus on language. And the real thing I want you to do is really think about the objectives you want your audience to, uh, to what, what is it you want your audience to, end your presentation with. And I'm going to, throughout this presentation, I'm going to just randomly break, stop sharing, and just go through one or two tips to help you become more persuasive when you are doing your presentation. So I'll just randomly, if something comes to me, I'll just say, stop, I've just had a thought. And if any of you have questions, please, please, please either interrupt me. I love to make this as interactive as possible because the most valuable thing Everyone is your time. It is your time. I have to really watch myself. I was on a course last week about inclusivity and in language, and it's very tempting. And I, I, I grew up in a past era where you would say ladies and gentlemen, and I've realized how it's so historic that uh, I'm still, so if I do slip and say ladies and gentlemen, I apologize. I'm trying my best to correct my use of language. Uh, so uh, I apologize in advance if I use any language that isn't, uh, that. In, in any way is offensive, I apologize now. So the method of human communication, either spoken, written, consistent with use of words in a structured and conventional way. Very, very powerful. It's a gift we've all been given. Use it with great impact. Muhammad Ali, the great, great, great Muhammad Ali was once asked, what is the shortest poem he knows that had meaning to him? And he said, me, we. I was like, whoa, so just two words, just two words, two words can make a big, big uh, difference. Just two words, me, we. So, so, you know, language, unless with language, unless you're Italian, less is more, okay? So with language, less, the fewer words you use, the better. I like those of you who've been to Italy and know exactly, exactly, exactly what I'm talking about. By the way, does anybody know what a barbarian, what the definition of barbarian is? Anybody know what the definition of a barbarian is? A barbarian is, the, is someone who doesn't speak Greek because the word barbarian comes from, if you didn't speak Greek, you were speaking ba 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 ba. So you were barbarian because you spoke ba ba. So anyway, that's interesting. That's the Greeks for you. So so I've offended the Greeks, I've offended the Italians. Let's see how we get on. And it's just as well I apologized at the beginning. Why is this concept of language relevant? Next week, we're going to talk about storytelling. And it's a beautiful presentation. I hope you're all here because we're going to talk about Pixar. And we're going to talk about all the great lessons we can learn as entrepreneurs, as communicators from Pixar around how to tell really beautiful, compelling stories. Because one of the things people always get confused about with pitching is... They think about pitching as this thing where you stand up and you do this thing. Pitching is the art of persuasion. Pitching is really the art of telling beautiful stories. So what you need language for is to communicate complicated ideas. You need it to ask for commitment. You need it to motivate people. But most of all, most of all, 
you need language to excite. The example I gave you about me, we. Think about that and how powerful that is. And it communicates very complicated ideas in just two, two words. It gets a commitment. It gets you to believe, I can do this. It does get you excited about the possibilities you as an individual have, and it can motivate you. Erin, I see some text flashes. What, what's happening? What's happening? I'm seeing flashes. I can't look at the text because it will spoil the whole flow. But what's going on, Erin? Is it, is it any questions yet or just people saying I'm too loud, too fast? No questions yet. Um, James McDonald just said he has a quick call he has to do, so he'll be back. James, we, we'll, 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 we'll await you with eager anticipation, so you'll be welcome back anytime. So what are the top tips? So one of the things I was really impressed by was Einstein. So one of the tests I do uh, is I try to, is there anybody here who doesn't understand the theory of relativity? Anybody here not understand the theory of relativity? Wow, everybody does, clearly. Okay, so I won't use that example then. Marla, uh, you, you were laughing then. Uh, Marla, I think you're a PhD. You're a doctor, aren't you, Marla? It's Dr. Cameron? No, okay. I, I, I thought j just just know know my life. I'm probably explaining uh, relativity to a theorist. I, I, I'm a I'm a genius. I'm a genius, Perm John, but I don't understand uh, relativity. Oh, I, I Carl, you just remember me of one of the the English are very very good at giving insults in a way that it doesn't feel like an insult. It's like the, you know they say the Irish can tell you to go to hell in such a way that you look forward to the trip. You know, and the English do these beautiful insults. And one of the best insults I heard about someone was I asked them, I said, uh, oh, what do you think of him? What do you think of him? And he said, you know, Pam Jock, he's a self-made man and he's in awe of his creator. Oh, beautiful. <laughs> you have to actually think about that. So when everybody says they're a genius, I, I just love that. So the theory of relativity is imagine, imagine I'm on a train. And imagine, Adam, imagine you're on a platform. So at the moment, I can see Sahil, Adam, uh, Michelle, Marla, and Carl. So that's, that's who I'm going to be picking on. And now Erin as well. So I can see Erin as well. So imagine I'm on a train and Adam is on a platform. Now, the train is going through the station. Now, I have a ball. And I am going like this with my ball. I'm throwing the ball up and down. So from where I can see it, the ball is going up and down. But from where Adam can see the ball, the ball is traveling this way. So time and motion depends on the perspective. Time and motion and distance traveled is relative. That is the basic theory of relativity. Why am I doing this? Because Einstein said himself, if you can't explain something to a six-year-old, it because you, it's because you don't understand it yourself. And I'm gonna repeat the next two points repeatedly throughout this presentation. You can either be effective or you can be the smartest person in the room. Choose, because you cannot, you cannot be both. Now, often what happens to us when we are in a persuasion situation, we're in a sales situation, we're in a pitching situation, because of insecurities, we like to use jargon, we like to complicate things. It's just, you know, so I've been on the, as I mentioned, uh, Colby Morgan is here from section four. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. If any of you are interested in those courses, please do look it up, section4.com. And um, I've been on these courses and you have these professors, awesome professors from around the world, teaching you these really, really, really complicated concepts. But I love the way they explain it. In, in, there's no jargon. There is no jargon whatsoever. It's just phenomenal how they explain these terrifically complicated uh, um, ideas and concepts with what using it in a really, really, really clever way. So you can either be effective or be the smartest person in the room, choose. Because the other thing about smart people is, let's be honest, we don't, we don't like them. It was interesting, Carl, as a joke, Carl, uh, Carl said, I'm a genius, I'm a genius. And it was a joke because we all know that you don't introduce yourself, hi, I'm a genius, my name's Pomjo. We don't do that, we don't do that. So the other thing that people often forget, they don't understand the audience. What is the audience? job what is it you want them to do now with pixar and with storytelling it's really 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 important that you do absolutely understand what the audience job is and it's also very important that you understand your objective your objective is not to inspire the audience with your latest technology people sometimes just want to talk about the product your product is actually the least interesting thing in your presentation it really is the business, the vision, the story 
is the most interesting thing. You know, if, if people want to talk to you about Apple, they uh, will um, talk about the vision, the ecosystem, the everything, the bits and pieces. They don't talk to you about the memory capacity of a phone. You know, they don't tell you about the USB or the lack of USB charges on Apple devices. They don't talk to you about the technical things. Yeah, but it's on the iCloud, it's only got this capacity, said no one ever. They talk about Apple, they talk about the whole thing. One of the things I will share with you is one of the courses I did on section four recently was called uh, T, the T algorithm st strategies. And the T algorithm looks at what is it about trillion dollar companies? Because billion, let's face it, billion is so 2020. So what is it about trillion dollar companies that they share in common? What are those characteristics? And one of the things, and okay, very small sample size, but one of the things they all share in common is visionary storytelling. Visionary storytelling. Companies like Shopify excel. They absolutely excel at visionary storytelling. So one of the things you've got to do to be able to craft those messages is understand your audience. Now, Peter Marrera next week, Sahil, I believe, at Volta is giving a talk on the 13th of April at 12 o'clock. Make sure you register for that. You've got to register for that because I cannot stress, having been on this course, how important effective communications with PR is. And this is all part of the same continuum because one of the things you can do is you cannot be there and be pitching. How do you do that? Through media and public relations. So make sure you go on that course. It's free. And Sahil, there are still some places. Just nod if there are still some places available. Yes, there are. Fantastic. So check that out, check that out. Everybody is welcome, great ecosystem, everybody working together. Understand your audience and of course, make sure you understand your objective. Why are you there? What are you hoping to achieve? What are you hoping to achieve? And what you wanna do is really understand, do you wanna win people's hearts? Do you wanna win people's minds? Or do you actually wanna win their share of wallet? Because sometimes a lot of people do a great presentation but you're left thinking, that was great, but I don't know what to do next. I've been to presentations that feel like a great Chinese meal. You know, you have a great, great, great meal. You have a great meal. And then half an hour later, you're hungry again. And you're like, what was that? What was all that? What was that? So make sure your presentation doesn't feel like that. Make sure that the presentation is, ends with a very clear, specific, very, very specific ask. Any questions? No comments? Everybody's happy with the pace I'm going at? All good? Yay, woo, great, fabulous, fabulous, thank you, thank you. Now we talk about simplicity. Now, what words are you using? Are you using formal, semi-formal, informal, or slang? So let me explain what I mean by this. So I'm gonna pick on Michelle. Michelle, how are you doing? How's Michelle doing? Michelle, you good? Yes, I'm looking at you, Michelle. Me are there Michelle, two Michelles on the call? there are two Michelles. Michelle Hul Hulbert. Yes. Michelle Hulbert? Have I said that properly? You did, well done. Great, Michelle, what do you call one of those things? You know, you drive them. What would you call one of those things that you drive? Uh, they're, in, they're in my driveway. A car. A car, great. Adam, can you think of another word to describe what Michelle said? Uh, <laughs> locomotive. Locomotive, automotive or locomotive? I said a horseless carriage. Uh, yeah, we're talking about a car. So yeah. another word for a car would be? Horseless carriage. Horses carriage. Okay, that's 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 interesting. That isn't what I was thinking, but that's interesting. Um, vehicle. So, vehicle, motor vehicle. So we've got motor vehicle. Sahil, what would you say? My mind goes to Tesla, but... Tesla, wow, interesting, interesting, Sahil. Your mind goes to Tesla. And Marla Cameron, what would you say? Automobile. Automobile. Interesting. So these are great examples of we're all describing the same thing, but nobody has actually come up with a Erin, you're from Yarmouth, you must know. Give me give me a slang word. Give me a slang word for a car. What slang would you use down in Yarmouth? Um, I'm not really sure if we have a slang word for a car. <laughs> I would just say whip. whip. Yeah, whip. There we go. <laughs> I've never heard That's a that. good one. I've never, I've never heard that whip. I've <laughs> never heard the word whip. So you call it, so a car is called a whip. That's the slang what? term for it, yes. Wow, you learn something new every day. That is something I didn't know. Thank you very much indeed. So now we have examples of formal, semi-formal, informal, or slang. Now the informal word is what Michelle said, which is a car. 
perfectly describes, and it's interesting, it was the first word, perfectly describes exactly what a car, what the thing we're describing, it's a car. Whip was slang. Interestingly, in England, does anybody know what we call a car in England, in London, in Cockney? Anybody know what Cockney for? So Cockney is this weird language in East London where everything rhymes with things, everything rhymes. So in England, a car is called a jam jar. So a jam jar is a car and it's very confusing. And I don't even know where some of the words come from. So if I was to say to Marla, Marla, me old China, how you doing? Marla's me old China. You're like, what? So in England, um, and I didn't even know the origins, I had to look it up. So uh, China is, it's a China plate, which rhymes with mate, which means friend. So China, so if you, somebody says, oh, he's me old China or she's me old China, it means they're their friend. Now, the other day I said to Sandra, Sandra, my partner, I said, oh, Sandra, would you have a butcher's at this? And I didn't even realize I was saying this. Oh, could you just have a butcher's at this? And I, she said, what does that mean? I said, butcher's, you know, to have a look at something. And then she was confused and she used Google to say, why is it called butchers? And it's from butcher's hook, take a look. So I don't, so sometimes I use these language that I don't even realize what the origin is. So if somebody says to you, oh, could you take a butcher's at this? It means, could you, could you take a look? The things you're learning today that will never ever come in handy. I promise you, if one of you said to me, oh, that tip of the, about the butchers really came handy. I'll be like, wow. Could you imagine if you're on a, who wants to be a millionaire? And that's the final question. Could you imagine? I'll take half the winnings. So, are you using formal, semi-formal, informal or slang? So slang would be whip or jam jar. Informal would be car. Semi-formal would be automobile. There is actually a formal word that the industry would use, which is something like a unitary motorized vehicle. Because when you're at Ford or something, they really need to be ultra specific of what is it you're talking about. You know, when you say car, no, 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 car is too vague at Ford. What exactly are you talking about? Because we manufacture loads of things. So formal, semi-formal, informal slang. Now, when we do pitches, when we talk to people who we think are smart, we feel the need to use formal or semi-formal when we should use informal. Erin, good to be here in Yarmouth. Do you like my automobile? You just would never say that, would you? You just wouldn't. You'd say, oh, oh yeah, these are my, these, uh, that's my car. Oh, do you like my car? That I just bought the car. Or in Sihil's case, do you like my Tesla? So how do, you, how do you spot a vegan, a Tesla owner or a CrossFit uh, practitioner? Don't worry, they'll tell you. So that's a, that's, a, that's a little joke as well. Hopefully I've offended now all vegans, all CrossFit trainers and all Tesla owners. I could have added, I could have added cryptocurrency trader in there as well. So we should always try to use informal language, not even semi-formal language as automobile. But yet when we're pitching, we try to do that. Use language that gets you as many supporters as possible, not a few. If you think about the best orators, the best orators like John F. Kennedy, Martin Luther King, Winston Churchill, uh, Nelson Mandela, you listen to their speeches. What's inspiring is how their words are simple but powerful. So dispel this notion that to use really persuasive arguments, you've got to somehow, it's, it's an intelligence test. One of the worst insults I can, I can deliver to you is, and I have delivered this to a few people when they do pitches to me, I'll say, great, that was brilliant. Now do that again, but this time assume I have to understand what you're saying. You know, that's the worst thing I could say to you. And I have said it to people because I'll sit through this pitch, which is beautiful. And I'll be like, and I know I'm not the smartest, but I also know I'm not that silly either. So please do explain to me what, what, you're, what you're trying to say. So always use simple language. Simplicity is key. How many words should you use in a presentation? We remember speeches with very few words. The Gettysburg Address is famous for how few words it used. I think it was a total of something like 164 or something. It was very, 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 very small. Somebody will Google it, no doubt, and correct and put it. Could you put it in text, somebody? Text, uh, put it in the chat box, how many words were actually used in the Gettysburg Address. There were very, very few, but it's one of those speeches that is remembered uh, 
quite rightly, and it uses extraordinarily, extraordinarily simple, but powerful, powerful language. You think about Winston Churchill, some of the great speeches he gave. You think about the, uh, the, the Martin Luther King speech, you know, I have a dream. Powerful stuff. Powerful stuff. Erin, do we have an answer? Do we have an answer, Erin? Yes, we have two, 272 words. Um, Zach put. Zach, Zach Labarge. There you go. Zach, well done. Well done. But the, the people with few words use the right words. So it's not about using too few words. Like I, I told you about the Muhammad Ali thing. Me, we, they were the right words. So it's not just, you know, can you give me a pitch in two words? No, you know, um, but you can give a great, we did this thing uh, in, in Cape Breton ages ago, where we did this thing called a pitch tweet, where we said, can you do your pitch in 280 words? Uh, no, 280 characters, 280 characters, the, the length of a, a, a tweet. And you can, you actually can. And you can always tell lawyers, I love lawyers, can you tell? You can tell that lawyers are paid by the hour by the amounts of words they use. And I just love the answer to every question. What's the answer to every question with a, that you ask a lawyer? Anybody knows? It's two words, two words. Every, every, every answer is, it depends. Use few words, use powerful words, and use simple words. So I hope as a key takeaway, you've all learned that you're gonna use few words, you're gonna use powerful words, and you're gonna use simple words. So this is how not to do it. I hope this works. Oh, so I gather you denied that Mr. Halifax's phone had been bugged. Well, obviously. It was the one question today to which I could give a clear, simple, straightforward, honest answer. Yes. Unfortunately, although the answer was indeed clear, simple, and straightforward, there is some difficulty in justifiably assigning to it the fourth of the epithets you applied to the statement. <laughs> Inasmuch as the precise correlation between the information you communicated and the facts, insofar as they can be determined and demonstrated, is such as to cause epistemological problems <laughs> of sufficient magnitude as to lay upon the logical and semantic resources of the English language a heavier burden than they can reasonably be expected to bear. Epistemological? What are you talking about? You told a lie. <laughs> a lie? A lie. What do you mean, a lie? I mean, you <sighs> lied. <laughs> uh, yes, I know this is a difficult concept to get across to a politician. Um, <laughs> uh, no, I'm sorry. No, ah, yes, you did not tell the truth. You mean, we are bugging you, had an extra telephone? We were. We were? When did we stop? Um, 17 minutes ago. <laughs> well, you can't call that lying. What would you call the opposite of telling the truth? Well, I mean, there was no intent. I didn't mean to deceive them. I'd never knowingly mislead the house. Nonetheless, you have done so. It wasn't my fault. I didn't know he was being bugged. Prime Minister, you are deemed to have known you are ultimately responsible. Why wasn't I told? The Home Secretary might not have felt the need to, to inform you. Why? Perhaps he didn't know either. <laughs> or perhaps he'd been advised that you did not need to know. Well, I did need to know. Apparently, the fact that you needed to know was not known at the time that the now known need to know was known. <laughs> Therefore, those that needed to advise and inform the Home Secretary perhaps felt that the information that he needed as to whether to inform the highest authority of the known information was not yet known. And therefore, there was no authority for the authority to be informed because the need to know was not at that time known or needed. <laughs> what? We did not know that you would deny it in the House. Well, obviously I would if I didn't know and I were asked. We did not know that you would be asked when you didn't know. I was bound to be asked, but I didn't know if I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> it was thought that it was better not to win. I hope you enjoyed that. I just love, I could watch that all, all. I, I just love, 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 love. Yes, Prime Minister. So many great lessons for entrepreneurs, uh, for people in the persuasion game in, in Yes, Prime Minister. There's a particular clip, if you have time, that you should look at, which is the um, market research. Market research. So if you go into YouTube and Google, Market research, no, no, you wouldn't go to Google, it's going to YouTube and search market research, yes, Prime Minister. And it's just a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant uh, exposition of why I don't trust market research data. So it's, it's just brilliant. So if you get a chance, yes, Prime Minister, that is about, that clip is about 40 years old. 
and I don't think it's dated. I just don't think it's dated. But that's how not to uh, do it. So I hope that, I hope that was that was useful. Erin, do we have a comment? Do we have a comment in the chat box? Yes, um, Sheldon from Pocket Finance said, "Please advise name of that show." <laughs> yes, yes, Prime Minister. Yes, Prime Minister. And before that, it was called Yes Minister. So there's Yes Minister and then Yes Prime Minister. And then Emily said it was hilarious, which Thank I you, Emily. Thank you very much, Emily. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. It's but people do talk like that. We have we have met people who talk like that. And it's just it's just uh, fabulous how many people think they're being clever and you're like just confused by it. Because what's interesting is it's very, very clever writing. Because if you did listen to what he said. It is actually saying you told a lie, that very long-winded explanation. It's still, you told a lie. So we do not warn to people who want to be the smartest person in the room. We just don't. We actually stop listening to them. How many times have you been to a presentation where people, I, I went to one pitch where the person started the pitch by saying, I am a marketing god. And it was just like, wow, okay. I'm, and I just stopped listening. And they may well have been a Martin God, but they certainly didn't know how to get their message across because they lost me. Now, they may be right. Some people are very, very smart. They may be right, but we don't, we just don't like them. And to get things done, you need buy-in. It's not about you. And this is the thing about language. It's not about you. It's about what you're trying to do with the language. And you need buy-in and to get buy-in, you need to be liked. And to be liked, you need to use friendly, accessible, informative language. Now there's this whole branch of psychology called neuro-linguistic neuro programming. And I've only dabbled in it. I've done a little bit of it. So there's no way I'm, a, I'm an expert in it. But what's really interesting about neuro-linguistic programming, one of the things it talks about is matching. So, one, and this is a very powerful sales technique. This is a very powerful persuasion technique where you actually use the words, not the words you hear, but the words they're saying. Um, when a customer is talking to you about their needs uh, and the customer says, you know, I need to reduce errors um, or something. And you don't say, so I hear that you need to reduce downtime. That's not what they said. That is not what they said. You've assumed that reduced errors means reduced downtime, but that isn't what they've said. And you've got to really listen to the words people use you got to listen to the words uh, investors use a great technique for you know when, when i said at the beginning know your audience if you're going to go and see a vc if you're going to go and see an angel investor okay ask them find out what kind of thing what is their investment thesis ask them at the beginning what what is your investment thesis what do you like to invest in could you give me an example of three things you've said no to and why you said no to them? Could you give me an example of three things you have invested in and why you invested in them? And that also shows at the beginning of the conversation that you're interested in having a conversation with the, the investor or the uh, person you're trying to sell to, okay? So use friendly, accessible, informative language that the person is actually using. Make sure you understand your audience. Why are they there? Why are they there? So often you, you, you go to these things and you don't know why the audience is there. So Sahil recently uh, did a, he, he emceed a um, Volta pitch competition. And it was brilliant because one of the things I really liked about Sahil, and I told you publicly at the time and in writing privately, Sahil, I, I really, really liked the way you, you, you steered that because unlike most demo days, and I think the Zoom, the virtual kind of thing helps, the, the expectation sometimes with the real world demo days is there are loads of investors out there waiting to write you a check, which, you, you know, most of us on this call know is not reality. But what Sahil did was he actually understood why the audience were there. And he also understood and communicated very clearly why the people pitching were there. And it was very much a demonstration of explain your new exciting things because people who are in the audience are people from the ecosystem who are just excited about what's going on in Nova Scotia. Tell us what's going on because there's some great innovation. People on this call represent the innovation that's going on across this great island of ours. Okay, so what Sahil did was he understood the audience, and that's sometimes a really good MC. It's their job to understand the audience. Some MCs fall flat when they do that because they uh, they 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 just don't understand the audience. I remember I went to a wedding, 
and it was the guy's third wedding, um, you know, but which is which is fine. But the the uh, the best man stood up, and the first thing the best man said was, uh, "Welcome, thank you. I apologize. Some of you have heard this speech twice before." Now he thought he was being funny, but it just didn't land. It just the audience. Had that been the night before at the bachelor party or something, it would have worked. It just didn't work in front of the families. It just didn't land. So even funny jokes are funny in context. So context is very, very important. Context is very important. There was a, I won't repeat that just in case of causing offense, but there was a very funny comedian, uh, Patton, uh, uh, I've forgotten his name, Patton. And he did these series of tweets where he would do one tweet, which seemed really, really offensive. And then later on, he would, he would send the second tweet, which made the first tweet look really funny. So um, have, uh, he was one of the uh, characters in uh, King of Queens. Um, so yeah, so, so that was funny. And then Burger King recently on International Women's Day tried to do this and it didn't quite work. I mean, I don't know if any of you knew what Burger King did on, yeah, you know? They did a tweet and I'll, I'll repeat it because it was so recent. Their first tweet was um, women belong in the kitchen. And this was International Women's Day. Women belong in the kitchen was their first tweet. Second tweet, which comes out hours later is, why is it that only 17% of our chefs are women? We need more women in our kitchen. And I can understand what they're trying to do, but it just didn't work. It just didn't work. It just it didn't work. So one of the things you've got to do is understand your audience because some things, context is so important. Why are they there? Um, what do they want? How much do they already know? And again, when you go to these uh, pitch, demo, uh, pitch demos, the, the one Sahil emceed, the audience, assume the audience don't know anything about, you know, about this. How can you move them? Why, you know, if you understand why I'm there, what, how can you, in your message, uh, get that, get that across? Okay, so get that across. So one of the things I heard of for recently uh, was somebody talking about make, make the mess, make your mess the message, make your mess the message, which is, what is it you're going through? What is the mess you're going through that could become a very, very powerful message for others? So have a think about that. So how can you move people? Understand your objective, different objectives. And then you've got to think about the language you use in context of what is the objective you're trying to achieve? Are you trying to get another meeting? Now with pitching, your objective is to get another meeting. It is not to tell them everything they need to know, everything they need to know. No, the objective is to interest them, excite them, enthuse them enough to say, I'd like to get another a meeting. It could be to excite people. If you are, uh, you know, if you want to know somebody who does this really, really well, but was a was a, was a con artist. It was, um, you know, the founder of WeWork. Uh, if if you want to see, he he could excite a crowd. He knew how to excite a crowd. So I'm not talking about that. And there's lots of there's lots of techniques you can use to excite a crowd. Some are ethical, some aren't. Um, but what he did was brilliantly excite a crowd. So if you're talking to your staff. You need to excite them and inspire them. That, that's your objective, to excite them, inspire them, to send them off to do something which is going to be awesome, which is going to be great. You know, we all watch movies like The Gladiator and it's all those inspiring, they're just about going to bat on those inspiring, yeah. yeah. But understand what is your objective? Why are you doing this? So if you're talking to your staff and teams, you're trying to excite them and inspire them. That is very different from, uh, you know, trying to get another meeting. And um, the, the other thing is, you know, do you want to enthuse people? Well, there are lots and lots of definitions of leadership. Um, I've concluded, there's this great book I read called Nine Myths About Work, Nine Myths About Work. And one of the myths they talk about is there's no such thing as leadership. The reason why there are so many books on leadership is because there isn't a thing. If I asked all of you to write down on a piece of paper, what is leadership? Um, all of you would uh, come up with a very different definition. One definition of leadership is the transfer, transference of enthusiasm. It's the transfer of enthusiasm from you to other people. So that is one definition of enthusiasm. So we're going to take a quick, quick 
break here. I want to just do stop share. One of those random things. One of those random random things. Right. I can see all of you. So I'm going to ask you to do something now. I'm going to Patsy. You have your hand is raised. Patsy, your hand is raised. Well, it was raised a while ago when you were talking about language and the use of words. And I just wanted to say that um, it's not just the use of words. I was shared a stage um, with Gabrielle Gabriel from um, Connor Smith Labs on Volta stage a few years ago. And her words were fantastic. Her crew was fantastic. The idea was fantastic. But every four or five words, she said the word so. So when we practiced in front of uh, Cox and Palmer and they gave her tips, gave us all tips on how to perfect the pitch, um, they just kept saying, you said so every four or five words. And I don't know if there's parents out there, but every time my son would tell me something and he would use the F word, he would say, are you listening? And I would say, well, I was until I heard the F word and then I forgot what you said before that. So it's not just, it's the flow and then the interruption of the good flow by dropping in an um or a so or an F word. And when they corrected her, she came back and she blew us away with her pitch, blew us away. She didn't say so once. So yeah. Yeah. it's not just the great words, great idea and the people, it's the fact that she just kept dropping so in there and it just distracted us totally from the pitch. Um, I actually, thank you, Patsy. I actually do talk about this and some of you have been to my pitch training before will know. Marla, you're nodding your head. You know how much I, I count. I count the number of uh, times you use the word so. And Marla, can you remember the other words I, I, I ban in a pitch? The other words I ban? Can you remember the other words I say don't, don't ever use the word basically or simply? Never use the word basically, simply. Because what you're saying is, um, um, so... Um, uh, Simon, um, I don't think you'll understand all of this, Simon Herbie. So basically, so simply, because you know you're not yeah. as intelligent as I am. So basically, or simply, so there are lots and lots of words uh, that you just don't use. What about es essentially? Essentially, or literally, <laughs> literally. There's a teacher yeah. in the UK that I worked with, and everything she said was literally. And yeah. I said, well, in my head, it was not literal every time she said it, and I, it just I, threw I, me I, off. I love it when sports commentators, I love sports commentators because, you know, bless them. They're not there for their intelligence. And um, I just love the way they think they're emphasizing something by saying the word literally. He literally chopped him in half with that tackle. And you're like, clearly he didn't. Otherwise the police would be there and he'd be on a murder charge. So clearly it wasn't a literal chopping him down in half. You know, but they say literally, oh my God, he literally took his legs out. Oh my God, he literally blew the roof off. And you're like, mm, no. So there are loads of words that you've got to be very careful about using. And a lot of people start their presentation with the word, so. Can I interject something? Please, from sorry, sorry, please Simon. I heard something on the radio one time that helped me. And it was, be, it was for the people that use so, um, those interjections. Um, I just did it. <laughs> So this person recommended just taking a pause instead of saying something and, and then makes you, it makes you look smarter. I know that's, you were just saying you're not supposed to do that, but it makes you seem more composed, more intelligent. Um, and that is brilliant. And I talk about this. Absolutely. I talk about this in my third session uh, when we do the actual pitching, when you pause, it makes you sound thoughtful. You're thinking of every word you're using. Every word is a deliberate choice. And then you can speed up to make emphasis or you can slow down. And people don't understand how powerful pausing, pauses and paces can be. The problem is a lot of people, we talk about theory of relativity, a lot of people say time travel is theoretically not possible. Those people haven't spoken publicly because when you speak publicly, you totally understand time travel because you have paused for a millisecond. The audience sees you pausing for a millisecond. In your mind, you have paused for 10 minutes. Hours have gone by during your millisecond pause. So be confident. We'll talk about all of this in the third session. Uh, but yes, thank you, Simon. Lots of things in the third session when we actually do the practice. We will, thank you, Emily. We will do, when we do the practice session, the third one, we will go through the use of so, the use of basically, pauses, 
Um, so what we're doing in, in terms of the structure of this workshop is today is about language, the building block. Then we will move on next to storytelling. Then the third session, which, and depending on how many people sign up for it, we may do two or three sessions. So you all get individual time because I want everybody to actually practice their, their pitch. I know Ariane and Patsy, you've been on, and, and Adam, you've been on other pitch sessions with me where I actually get you to practice. And that is, and Simon, you has, have as well. And that is far more valuable because pitching is a skill. It's not a theory. You could read books about pitching, but until you do it, you know, you wouldn't get into a car with a person saying, I don't know, you know, I've never driven before, but don't worry, I've read all the books. How hard can it be? I've read all the books. Pitching is the same thing. You can't, that there are certain skills you do have to practice. And pitching is a skill that you have to have to practice. Adam, I see your hand raised as well. Patsy, would you mind lowering your hand as well? Uh, thank you. Adam, if you could, uh, you have a question? Uh, yeah, question. So let's say, you know, nature of the beast, you screw up in a pitch and a presentation. I've been told that instead of saying sorry or kind of fumbling over your words, take a second and say, oh, excuse me, and then kind of um, reintegrate back into the, into the presentation. Would you agree with that? Would you use a different word? Is there- I would be human, to err is human. Weirdly, I was in sales. Uh, I, my background is sales. I've been in sales all my life. And one of the things I had to do in my first, one of my first jobs was do a lot of cold calling. And um, what I found was weirdly, as I got more experienced, and not using the word better, as I got more experienced, my response rate started dropping. I was less effective. I was working harder, but I was less effective. And that is because people did not enjoy the polished sales approach. Hi, Adam, my name's Pundit Valley. I'm calling you from. Today's your lucky day. Let me tell you why it's your lucky day. Because exclusive to the zone you're living in, we are able to announce this today. You just don't like it. Whereas, um, um, hi, Adam, um, my name's Permjot. You probably haven't heard of my company before. This is a bit of a long shot, so I hope you don't mind me calling you. But we've got a few people in your area. And they, we did this offer with somebody who lives down your street. And they really, really like the offer. So we thought it might be interesting to offer it to other people in the neighborhood. So can I just tell you the offer that your neighbor took advantage of? Now I know exactly what I'm doing because the hook is your neighbor took advantage of. That's yeah, the hook. Yeah. So I know exactly what I'm doing, but I'm coming across as not polished. When I started doing that, when I started doing umming and ahhing, my sales went, went up. So be careful. And I always say to people, when you do get ready for your pitch, be 90% ready. Don't be 100%. Because, and we've all seen these pitches, haven't we? Oh, I always talk about the South African pitch. I always talk about the South African pitch. They always pitch the same, the same way. South Africa has many problems and they look to the side. Racism, racial strife, corruption, crime. But we have a problem. We have a solution to that problem. We have a pencil that takes 25% less lead. So what they've done, they've built you up all the way here and then the solution is down there. It's like, no, don't do that. Because again, with storytelling, people sometimes overhype the promise. What I was going to do, the reason we broke was, what I want you all to do very quickly, and if you've got your cameras on, that'd be awesome because then I can see you, then you can participate. If you want to keep your cameras off, I respect that. But if you could, I'm going to say a word. I'm going to say a word. And then I want you all to write down the first five words that come to your mind. The very first five words. Are you ready? Are we ready? We are ready. So thank you, Paula. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great to see you, Paula. Where are you joining us from, Paula? I'm in Yarmouth County, a little place called Tusket. Tusket. The only place I've not been to in Nova Scotia, to my great shame, is I haven't been further south of, I think, Lunenburg. I've never been further oh. south of Lunenburg. So you got to come. Hopefully I will. I will. I, when the pandemic is over, hopefully I'll be making my way to Yarmouth and, and to that charming place. So have you all written down the first five words that came to mind when I said the word family? Fabulous, fabulous. Paula. Could I ask you to give me just one, just one of the words you used? Just one of the words you used, Paula. Social. Social. 
Great. No, no, great. There's no right or wrong answer, clearly. Social. Does anybody else, could you put your hand up or could you do an indication if anybody has the word social? Two people, two people out of 31. Wow. Okay. Uh, Kyle Matthews. Kyle Matthews from Renault Hub. Woohoo. Kyle, give me one of your words. Uh, I, I find any time somebody asks about your family, it's like a relatable thing because yep. then you can start connecting on that on that space. So what was the one word you used? Just one of the five relatable. words. Sorry? Relatable. Relatable. Anybody else have the word relatable? No. Great. Uh, Ariane. Ariane, give me one of the words. Family, give me one of the words that you used. Together. Together. Did anybody else use exactly the word together? Put your hand, uh, Marla did. Marla? Marla's and, and, wow, Sheldon and Swati. Thank you very much. Swat, Swati, Shah and Paula. Wow, so that was interesting. Looting, give me one of the words, looting, one of your words that you had. Um, mm, reliable. <laughs> reliable, I love, I love the way you had to think about reliable. That's what it does. Reliable, did anybody have the word reliable? Nobody had the word reliable. Excellent, looting, that's the point of this exercise. I'll, I'll stop it there. Uh, interesting how many people didn't mention the word love. You know, uh, friend, warm. Oh, now, yes, yeah, sure, sure. Now you all say, oh, yeah, 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 sure. You had your chance. I don't believe you. Yeah. So, uh, looting. Um, what's really interesting is Sheldon. That's a great picture. That is a great picture, Sheldon. That is a great, great picture. Um, looting. What's interesting is we, we, when I say a word like family, we all know what the word family means. We all know what the word family means, but we all have very different ways of having an effect with it. So Plato, uh, when he had, had no Socrates, was it Plato? no Plato's theory of forms theory, his theory was that when we, uh, when we, when I say the word elephant, there's this cloud, there's this kind of universe of forms. And when I say the word cloud, I, uh, when I say the word elephant, I immediately go to this place. And then Paula is also going to this place and accessing the same imagery and the same word. And that's how he, he, he saw the world. When you think about that theory, that's what happens with language, that, that there are so many words that even a word like family conjures up so many different emotions and so many different think feelings and so many different words. What do you think is gonna happen when you use a word like bracelet or industrial designer? or uh, agricultural density, or solar panels, whatever it is. When you think about how you use those words, wow, it's gonna make a very, very big difference. So now I'm gonna go back to my share screen where we were. So I hope you didn't mind that quick interlude. Erin, um, is there any more comments or anything? Nope, I think we're good. Excellent, excellent, excellent. And we're gonna finish well ahead of time, like well ahead of time. Uh, so that we have lots and lots of time for Q&A, because I love Q&A and I, I love having these discussions with people. So think about your objective. What is your objective? Use words. And it was really great that Kyle used the words relatable. Now you would think family and relatable. Wow, makes a lot of sense. Uh, Looting, when she said uh, reliable, interesting, really interesting um, that, you know, uh, you would actually uh, use that word and nobody else thought about that word so, and it's, so it's very interesting when you do this exercise is it to get a commitment from people and if it is to get a commitment think about the words you use that would inspire them so here's your exercise for this is the homework i want all of you to do for next week i want you all to do this homework i'm not going to check on you whether you do the homework or not it's totally up to you we're all adults but this is the exercise i want you to do how do you want your audience to feel after your talk and then think through what words would get you to feel that way. And that's a separate exercise and, and spend five minutes on this. How do you want your audience to feel after you've spoken to them about a, 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 an issue you're tackling, a solution you're solving? The other thing, and maybe this is a separate presentation about those trillion dollar things. One of the things that uh, the, the, the course talked about was Successful companies are very, very clear about understanding the human instinct that they appeal to. They're very clear about the human instinct they appeal to. And there are four primary human instincts. Knowledge, the need to give or receive care, consumption, and ego. Those are the four big things. So think about 
Which human instinct are you appealing to? Which human instinct are you appealing to? So what words would you use to help your audience feel that way? What do you want them to think? So there's feeling and there's thinking. There's feeling and they're thinking, and they're, they're sometimes very different things because you may want them to think about doing something, but you use such powerful words that they're just overwhelmed with anger or overwhelmed with emotion or overwhelmed with something and they just can't even think of it. Like the South African thing where the words, the audience felt a certain way and then my emotions came crashing down. So think about what you want them to think. And then think about the action you want them to take. What is the action? What do you want them to do? Now, would you use different words to make them feel a certain way? Would you want them to you, would you use different words to make them think a different way? Or would you use different words to make them do something? So have a think about those things. Because we don't, it's really weird how we just do, don't spend time thinking about language. And yet it's something we, we do every day. But really do think about language. And almost use a Dr. Zeus book, which is Do Dr. Zeus always used simple words and powerful words. How would you say this? Yeah. Rhyme, rhymes work, you know, uh, one of the best pitches for a movie was uh, it's jaw, it was a dog, it was a movie about dogs, but it was like uh, pitched as it's jaws with paws. And um, it was a terrible movie, like terrible movie, but the pitch was famous for, it was such a good pitch, everybody got it, it's jaws with paws. So how do you want your audience to feel, how do you want them to think, and what do you want them to do? So thank you very, very much indeed. I'm going to stop share and then hopefully I can see you all. Uh, thank you very much. We finished at 12. So now we have about 20 minutes set aside for your questions and your answers as well. So Erin, do we have any questions? Ego, not, yes. Not so far. Um, yeah, Michelle's question was uh, answered. So that's great. Right. Perfect, perfect, perfect. So what I'm going to do is Marla, and then I'm going to come to you, Carl, then I'm going to come to you, Simon. So Carl Hallett, get, Carl Hallett, get ready, and then Simon, get ready. Marla, if you had a question, what would your question be? And then I'm going to ask Carl, and then I'm going to ask Simon. So Marla, if you had a question, what would your question be? For you? Um, helping me get rid of my ums in my, in my talk getting myself more confident in making you feel like you can win over the room while talking. This is why I let Angie do the talking because I'm the nerd. What do the audience want? The nerd? No. Are you sure? I think so. I think they, will, they want her heart more than, than anything. She's better, she, she gets more excited. Marla, which human instinct do you appeal to? Uh, kindness. Do you think so? I think so. Okay, so have a think about that because I think you appeal to the consumption, the need to consume instinct. So when, when we're talking about the need to consume and how to consume more for less, how to consume more safer, et cetera, et cetera, when we, when we do that. So I think, you know, there is a place. One of the things that happened, there, there's a company I've invested in, Talon Health. Um, and I always dealt with the CEO and he's a great presenter, Paul Travis, great presenter, great presenter. And then one day, for whatever reason, it was Matt Kay who was presenting, who was his co-founder, Matt Kay. Matt Kay was awesome. He rocked. I was like, wow, Matt, I didn't know you could present. He said, yeah, we just, you know, but he was awesome. So I think, Marla, it's not about being good, being bad, it's about being different. It's about being different. And don't don't say, uh, oh, I'm the nerd. That. No, you appeal to a different human instinct. You will appeal to a different audience. Uh, I think Angie is phenomenal. I've seen her pitch and she's been very successful at it. She's won competitions through her pitching. So clearly she's very good. But what I would say is she's very good at that stage of the pitching. Now, it may be that she's your opener and then you come in with, you know, now the science bit, you know, when you do those L'Oreal adverts and they have Jennifer Aniston doing the da da da, -da and then she says, now the science bit, and then there's a different voiceover. Maybe you could be, you know, now the science bit. There is a role for that. There is a space for that. And in terms of the ums and the ahs, how do I give you more confidence? Only you can give yourself more confidence. And the way you do that is by practicing. What you've got to do is practice silence. It's not awkward. It's not. And as a science person, I would expect you to be doing more thinking around your words. 
not um and ah, because uh, it, it it doesn't give our ears a break. That's that's the reason why we hate ums and ahs is it's uncomfortable because it doesn't give our ears a break. So when you just yeah. So I tell you somebody, I don't. I hope yeah, James, you don't mind me calling out James McDonald. If you look at James' uh, presentation, uh, three, two years ago, two and a half years ago, to yeah. now, oh my gosh! And James is really good now. Public speak. He's now asked to do public speaking for politicians. He has got really, really good. And I think James, I think it's fair to say, when you first started, you hated, 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 hated public speaking. You just Very hated awesome. the passion. And and now. You hello, <laughs> and now uh, you uh, and now you um, are very very good at public speaking, James. It's been through practice, through practice, and also recognizing why people want to hear from James. From all the training I get from you, the, 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 I think that's five percent. Ninety five percent is definitely oh. your efforts in trying and embracing it. Marla, embrace it, embrace it, and stop saying things like, "Oh, I'm the nerd." That that that's that. Those comments, believe it or not, when you say that, so. Uh, quick tip, quick tip, and then we'll come to Sheldon. Quick tip. Big difference between when and men and women before they go into a presentation. Big, big difference. Men will go into a presentation. Kyle, I'd love it if you could say, yes, you do this. I'd love it if you said this. Sheldon, you're a finance guy. I know you do this. I know you do this. You know, before you go to a big pitch, you say to yourself, I've got this. I can do this. I can do this. Do you know what women tend to say before they do a big pitch? This is based by data. If anybody wants to ask me where the data comes from, I'm happy to supply it to you. Women go, can I do this? How can I do this? And that is much more helpful. The best thing, Sheldon, Kyle, the best thing you can do is start coaching yourself. And the way you coach yourself is now, before you go into a pitch, before you go into a big presentation, never say to yourself, I can do this. I'm a tiger. Urgh. Don't do that. Don't do that. Instead, do... Can I do this? Yes, I can. But how? How am I going to do this? Because then you start coaching yourself. You start coaching yourself. You are a very, very powerful self-coach. The other thing is when things go badly, we do three things, which is terrible. All of us do this. Humans, when, when a pitch goes badly and there's this ocean of rejection, and the question is, how do you, how do you, stay, uh, how do you stay afloat in this tower? Of, uh, in this ocean of rejection and the way you do that is because often what we do is we do three things or the three p's when we face a rejection it's we think it's personal oh why didn't it work well Aaron, why did that pitch go so bad Aaron, oh she's they hate me they just hate me it's just the way i came across they just they just you know anybody called Aaron, they hate the last person who pitched was called Erin. They hated her as well. So it could be that you make it personal and it's never personal. The next thing you do is you have a sense of, uh, it's called per uh, pervasive. This always happens to me. This, this is, this is just always happens to me. It's just like, why do I bother? Why, why, why do I do this? Why do I put myself in this situation? And then the final thing you do is you say it's permanent. It's catastrophe. This is the end of the world. I can't believe I failed that. This is, this is, you know, this is a catastrophe. So, those three things, and then again, uh, a tip, this is not on the agenda, I didn't know I was gonna talk about this, hopefully this is useful. Tip for avoiding that is, if a friend came to you, if I came to you, uh, Ariane, and said, Ariane, I've just, I, I just think I'm in the wrong job, I did this pitch presentation, it was awful, I think people don't like me, it's, it's just people just don't respond to me, I think, it's, I think I'm horrible at this, it always happens to me, Ariane, I try my hardest and I just didn't get any questions, I didn't get any reaction, it's just, and uh, this is a catastrophe, Arian, because I don't know what I'm going to do. This, this, this is, I, was, I was hoping this was going to be my life and this is my future. And now it's all over. Now, Arian, hopefully, as, as a friend, you would say, whoa, 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 slow down. And you'd coach me into stop. So sometimes you've got to be your best friend and you've got to self-coach. One of the things I'm loving learning, Daniel Pink, he, teach, he teaches this all the time. Self-coaching, so powerful, self-coaching. So if there's one bit of advice I'd give you is use your ability to be a self-coach. Back to the questions, back to the questions. So I was going to ask Kyle, if you had, but Marla, was that helpful? Marla, was that helpful? Great. Kyle, if you had a question, what would your, no, uh, I was going to ask Simon and then I was going to ask Carl. Simon, if you had a question, what would your question be? So I, I don't understand a question for, for what? No, if you had a question, you, you have the ability to ask me anything you want, Simon. What would your question to me be? 
And I'll come back to you. I'll ask Carl because Carl hopefully has a question ready. Carl, if you had a question, what would your question be? I only wanted to know, uh, Permjot, what those other, uh, were they instincts? Uh, there was knowledge and a requirement to care and be cared for. What were the other ones? Right, so the four human instincts. So the language in the course is different, but the, my interpretation of the language is, it's knowledge. So Google appears yeah. for human instinct for knowledge. There's the give and receive care, which is Facebook. You know, the need to give and receive care be part of the thing. There's the need to consume, which is companies like Walmart, Intel, uh, Amazon. They, they appeal to our instinct to consume more for less. And then there's Tesla, which appeals to our ego. Ah, ego. Oh, yeah. Ego. ego. So the need to give and receive care. Consume and ego. Yeah. Okay. Good. That's, I just wanted to know. So I was just being factual. That's all. I don't not have any other questions. Thanks. Not a, not a problem. Bill, did you raise your hand just to say hello or did you have a question, Bill? Bill, yeah. Question? yeah. 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 I, I see your presentation and I see that you have some uh, and correct the people. And the one thing I want to learn from you how you inspire the yourself to the audience because how do, I, how do i inspire myself yeah to the audience because you you encourage them you when i see your you do you <coughs> me but uh, for me i if i want to practice like you how i drive the my speech to the audience and transfer to them that's a really interesting question bill all of us have different motivational things all of us have different motivational things some are motivated by money although money can never give you that enthusiasm it just can't money money is a good uh, hygiene. Uh, money is a great hygiene motivator, but it's not a great inspirer in terms of elevating performance. That's why performance related pay never works. It just doesn't work. And yet companies insist on doing performance related pay and they're all the data, all the evidence shows it doesn't work. And yet what do 97% of companies do? They insist on performance re uh, performance reviews. They insist on pay rises based on that. It's just, it's just garbage. So um, what inspires me is two things. One is it actually when I get rejections, it really inspires me to prove people wrong. That is a huge, I'll show you. You don't think I'm good enough for this? I'll show you. So that's one motivation. There. And, and the other thing is, um, I, I think I, I'm now 50 years old. So, um, you know, I, I am inspired very much to pass on. It gives me great joy to see people who weren't good at presenting or who... I can see have improved. Like when I see James on my courses, it, it, I, I can't begin to describe the impact that has. I can't begin to describe the impact. I remember I did this pitch coaching with these, uh, with this, these two brothers in Arkansas. And um, I got a letter from their mother, a letter from their mother about the impact the confidence from being able to present had on their lives. These are young, two very young boys. Wow, that's meaningful. That that so, Bill. That's where my motivation comes from. And and you've got to find. You've got to dig deep and say, why do I want to do this? Simon Sinek talks about this. Start with the why. Why do you want to do this? Why do you want to do this? Paula, you just had a question. I'll say, how do you focus? Stay focused. Great. You just um, yeah. I just answered your question. Thank you. Thank you, Paula. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paula. Thank you. Um, so, do you, Simon? Do you have a question for me? Um, I find that you're, you seem to be able to convey enthusiasm, excitement, um, pretty easily virtually, and that can't be an easy thing to do. So maybe if you have any advice on that. Yeah, sure. Simon, do what you want to do. Um, your, your enthusiasm, cause you come across sometimes it's really interesting talking to you and I hope you don't mind me being very, 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 cause I've, I've spent a lot of time with you actually on, on zoom courses. Um, you are very passionate about a limited number of subjects. You become very passionate and alive when you talk about the subjects that resonate with you. So what I say is dig deep, and this is what I say to Marla as well, dig deep and find, hang on, this is the stuff I want to talk about. The other stuff I don't actually want to talk about. And you, you don't have to, you don't have to. This is a great thing, you can pitch in teams, you can be part of a, you know, it's a team thing. So find the areas you want to drill in on, find the areas, you know, so we're now, so hopefully that answers your question. So drill deep and find the things that it is that you, you want to, you want to speak about. Sheldon, you had a question. You've been raising your hand. Uh, I, I had a quick question and a comment. Um, so first, sorry uh, for having the baby on. My wife's trying to do some schoolwork on the side. Um, do you have any 
you know, you mentioned it sounded like that really interesting marketing research on the SBI Prime Minister. It sounds like you've listened to a lot of Dan Pink. If there's any additional, because uh, I feel like this is very sobering and probably the most important thing I've ever attended as a startup lead. Uh, and I've been fed. I've never been Tiger. I've always kind of been uh, shy in my youth. I've always been fed this delusion that I was good at presenting. And I think in a very generic, uh, in some scenarios I am, but, but there's such a, you know, the startup world is so much different. Investors, pitch competitions. Um, and it again, it's been very sobering. And uh, I'm so grateful for the kind of the, the, the kick in the rear to have a clue that there's there's such a huge spectrum of of being able to understand the different levels of audience that they need to present to. So um, just quick, you know, thank you for giving me a clue and any additional things that you can send out in any, any links, um, um, any books or anything, because I feel like I really need to beat all of this in really, really uh, deeply. Okay, so thank you, Sheldon, thank you. Firstly, thank you very, very much. You don't, you can go to courses and, and, and Ignite and, and let them know, because one of the things that people at Volta and Ignite and at Planet Hatch are desperate for is, Tell us what you want us to put on. So, so talk to Erin. Uh, one of the great things you could all do is email Erin, not just with feedback, because you know if you say the, if the feedback is that was great, that was great, brilliant. But that's not learning for me. And I just finished a book about Netflix and the Netflix culture. And the Netflix culture is very much around um, um, be ca candor, real candor, but helpful candor, actionable candor, not just poem.jot, you suck. Well, I can't do anything with that feedback. Thanks very much. You don't like me, but I can't do anything with that feedback. Poem.jot, you were great, but had you slowed down, your message would have resonated more with certain people. <coughs> great, actionable feedback. So one of the things you can do is, all of you, please, 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 if you've enjoyed this and you think you'd enjoy more, email Erin, Erin Nickerson. Erin, could you put your email address in the box for everybody? Although everybody should have your email address because you sent out the Zoom link. So email Erin and say to Erin, Erin, I would like a course on this, or I want this. The other thing is, Sheldon, people like me, the way I make my money is I read lots and lots and lots of books. I read about two books, uh, about three books a month. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to learn all the time. I'm trying to get better all the time. Because one of the things that really disturbed me was there was this consultant we hired. And this consultant hadn't upped their game in about three or four years. And that really, really bothered me. And I, 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 I got rid of the consultant. Because I do a lot of, I, I actually, as you know, I, I'm actually involved in businesses and I do this part time. Um, but invest, be authentic, invest in what you're going to do. Uh, if I want to be a consultant, how dare, how dare I stand up in front of you and take up an hour of your time? There's been an average of about 30 people on this call. I've taken 30 hours. I've taken a week's productivity. How dare I stand up here and take an, a week's worth of work? without investing in myself, without training, without being as good as I can be, without learning about some of these techniques I'm sharing with you today, I learned last week. I learned the week before. The thing about Daniel Pink, that was last last week. So the point is keep getting better. I'm going on courses about the human instinct. That was a course I went on three weeks, four weeks ago. So keep investing in yourself. And, and Sheldon, there's only so much things you can do as an entrepreneur. There's only so much time. Outsource to Erin. Erin, uh, you know, like the Matrix, where I need to learn how to drive this helicopter quick. Can you download it? Erin, I need to learn everything about X, Y, and Z. I need a course on that. Because otherwise, what happens is um, we are trapped in only giving you the same content every single time. So if you look at all these incubators, they all give you the same programming again and again and again. And that's because people don't tell them, that was good, but what I really need is this. And you'd be amazed if you said, what I want to do is learn about Persuasion. I want to learn about the psychology of persuasion. Can you do a course on the psychology of persuasion? Yes, we can, if you want it. If only one person wants it, we can't. But if lots of people say, listen, I want to learn more about those techniques, Pernod was talking about how to persuade people. Great, we can do that. I want to learn more about how to hire people. I want to know more about how to create a culture in my organization. Whatever it is you want to do, we will find you somebody awesome, awesome to deliver that content. But tell us. So Sheldon, please do tell us. Emily, you have a question. Emily, what's your question? Hello, how's it going? Very well, thank you, Emily. You tell me. Do you still have the enthusiasm for it? Was Am I still good? <laughs> yeah, you're still good. Hello. The baby loves it. The baby ha felt the need to. Like, why did you turn up the volume? Um, but anyways, I was wondering about um, smaller pitches, like if you are at an event and you run into someone and you want to kind of like give them an idea, but not 
pitch that? Yeah, I guess like talking about yourself and like what you do. Great. What you so I think I'm really good at this stuff. And then I met this guy called Richard Mulholland, who I've worked with for about five, six years. Richard Mulholland is based in Cape Town. He is brilliant. If you think I'm good, oh my God, he's off the charts good. I learn from him. I don't want to do myself out of business. You still want to hire me because I can do weddings and bar mitzvahs as well and he can't. Um, but Richard Mulholland from Cape Town is brilliant and he is, is, I think his web thing is missing link. And he taught me this technique. And I, when you're doing a micro pitch for yourself, Emily, this is what you do. So somebody says, oh, what do you do? You know when X, Y, Z, that's what I do. So you know when you're a technical founder, Marla, and you want to give your presentation to an audience of, you know, lay people, I can help you give a fantastic presentation. So you know when, that's what I do. That's a really good micro pitch at a networking event. Whereas do not do the pitch that I used to treat, teach people to do, which is you do your elevate a 30 second pitch. I've now learned Again, we're constantly learning. Some of the stuff I taught people even two years ago, I'm now learning is not as effective. None of it's wrong. It's just not as effective as new techniques I'm learning. So this new thing that Richard taught me is just, wow. I look at the response. I'll be on an air, I'll be on a plane or something. I'll meet someone. What do you do? Hi, my name's Pernod. What do you do? You know, when you're giving a presentation, which is technical to a non-technical audience, I can help make that wow. Then, okay. then that about the conversation. So, what is it you do, uh, Emily? Hi, Emily. Nice to meet you. What is it you do? I'm a screenwriter, and I'm no, 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 no. You, wait, wait, wait. you know when? Yeah, to give uh, like uh, I say, like you know when you want to watch a really good romantic comedy, but I write it. <laughs> That's it. Good one. That's okay, because then not everyone likes romantic comedies too. Is another thing, but like you don't want to talk to those people either, because the great thing about that is you know when. So if I meet Cara at a party and Cara is simply not my target market, okay? Right. But Kyle could be, Cara, you know when you want to talk to a pro? Yeah, I don't do that thing. Okay. I have people time. who like maybe they're in horror or some other random genre, but they know people they that like at Hallmark. So how do I do that? You know, like they, they might like I could chat with them and stuff, and then maybe down the road they'll be like, by the way, my best friend is da da da, you know, whatever. Like a cool person, so. anyway, great, great. It's all about being likable, which you come across as very likable. And it's all about saying that thing about I do rom-coms. Because the other thing is, a, a great mentor of mine, a great, great Mike Sikorsky, great, runs a company called Robots and Pencils, phenomenal guy. He gave me this bit of advice. He said, none of the world's best restaurants do a buffet. Okay? None of the world's best restaurants do a buffet. You don't go up to a Shangri-La and say, what time do you eat as much as you can? Buffet open. They don't do that. They do this one dish and they do it superbly, superbly, okay? So don't be the buffet. And yet too many startups, too many consultants. Oh, I can do that as well. Yeah, I, I can do that. Oh yeah, I do weddings, but I actually have done a wedding. I actually have MC <laughs> a wedding. So I can, I haven't done a bar mitzvah yet. I haven't, I've, been, I've done it, I was the best man at a Jewish wedding, um, but doesn't quite count. Jewish weddings, I don't know if any of you have been to them. They're weird. If you ever get invited to a Jewish wedding, make sure you go nobody parties like at like a jewish wedding oh my god they're crazy the music begins and they just start dancing none of this english stuff we let them have a first dance <laughs> then we'll wait a bit longer the music goes they just go crazy and it's like whoa whoa so um the point is emily it saves a lot of time if you just say uh, i romantic comedies that's what i do and then they may say to you do you do horror do you do i don't but i know people who do Right, right. And also, it seems like the, the that format is really good for business, like what I do. And maybe I could modify it to like, have you ever watched a show where, and then like say like, you know, bad story happened. Well, I, I write romantic comedies that are xyz yeah. awesome so then yeah. they know oh emily is an expert in or specializes in romantic comedies that are great and she knows story yeah but emily don't do that don't do that okay. the reason why there, you, you know you know when you ask them a question like like it's got to be you know when don't ask them the question which you did is you you know you saw a horror movie or you ask a question remind, remind me how you started that you asked um, a, like have you ever seen a show yeah, have you ever seen, yeah. had a bad story some, something Right. What happens is when you ask somebody, have you ever seen, or when you ask a question like that, yeah, their mind will wander to the movies. Because movies, okay. if you ask me, if I talk about a movie now, like The Departed, one of my favorite movies, The Departed, 
all of you are now thinking about that movie. It doesn't matter what I say now. For, I've lost you now for about 30 seconds. Gotcha. Okay, so keep going. So be very careful. Be very careful that you don't ask audience questions. You can say, you know when, and they've placed that's that's placing them in a situation. Ah, you know when, when you, you see okay, I'm gonna write that down. No worries. Right, when you say, you know, have you ever seen a horror movie? And then I think I, the last thing you want me doing is thinking about poltergeist, you know, because all I remember you then as the poltergeist lady. That's that's what will get <laughs> and, 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 and trust me, nobody, nobody, nobody wants that's why I'm not in horror. I'm just <laughs> okay, so I hope that's helpful, Emily. I hope that's helpful. That is helpful, yeah. And I guess it's challenging too, because like when you're at a networking event, one second, baby, you don't know who you're gonna meet. Like I could be meeting somebody who's like a gaffer or an audio or whatever, or the head of Netflix unless I'm looking them up right as I'm in the Zoom meeting, you know, I don't know who I'm meeting. And so I want to be able to just say something that like is true and, and wonderful. And it's kind of like, you know, you want to be chill and whatever, but it's also like, it feels high pressure, so. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. No, thank you very much. So I know if any of you do want to leave, zero issue, zero issue. I'm just here for Q and A, but if people do need to leave, I appreciate that. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your lunchtime with me and with Erin, really appreciate that. I'm gonna stay on uh, for another six, seven minutes and answer any questions. Michelle, Michelle Herbert. I just love the surname, Herbert. Where's that come from, Michelle? Where's that surname come from? I believe there's some English and Dutch influences. That could be said for almost everything in the world. Yeah. English and yeah. <laughs> I, I have to tell you, I hope, I hope this isn't, I hope this isn't uh, bad. Well, I was 21 at the time, the best insult, and I still remember it. 29 years later, I remember the best insult I was ever delivered was from somebody uh, who was Dutch. I remember I, I went for a meal. It was my friend's 21st birthday. I was trying to show off, etc. There was a lovely waitress. She was Dutch and she was serving drinks. And I said, oh, where are you from? And she said, oh, I'm Dutch. And I said... I'm going to marry someone who's Irish or Dutch. And then she said, I guess it'll be Irish then. Oh, well it so done. Beautiful. It was so beautiful. <laughs> so, it was so, so, so beautiful. It was like when somebody insults you in a beautiful way, you're like, way. James, you are very welcome. Always great to see you. Thank you very much. Michelle, what was your question? Sorry, if you had a question, what would your question be? I, I think Emily asked my question or the, the uh, big question that was on my mind was that it's that 30 second when you meet or less when you meet somebody uh, and they ask you, you know, what do you, what do you do? What do and you do? Uh, I'm a life and leadership coach for women. So let's do that. You know, when let's do that. Oh, let's do that. So I actually what, wrote no, it down. Don't, don't, don't lead with. So, okay. okay. So, <laughs> You know, when you have a big life or a career decision to make and you're not really sure what's the right thing to do, I help you make the best choice for you. Whoa! Oh, hey, good one, good one. Thanks. Uh, see, Thanks. Michelle, how about car? You loved that, didn't you? That worked, didn't it? Yeah. And the great thing about it, Michelle, not everybody will be in that zone. Not every, but it's a great conversational opener. I mean, yeah. I can't imagine being stuck for what to say to you next. I just can't imagine that. Now, if somebody says, you know, I'm a life coach, I'm a this coach for women. Mm, uh, well, Cause I know not just that because I have all these connotations about what, to, you know, the, what that test we did with the word family. I've got so many things going through my mind when somebody says life coach and this and that, you know, but suddenly you've contextualized it. You've provided a beautiful context. You've made it about me. You know when I help you, wow. And then I say, oh, Michelle, I could do that. Actually, Perm Jock, I'd love to, but I found that I focus on women leaders. Mm -hmm. Oh, great, scarcity, I want it even more. And now, Swati, you're very welcome, very welcome, thank you. But uh, Michelle, what I'm doing now is you, you've kind of like made sure that you're only talking to people who are like in your wheelhouse and their scarcity. So I'm like, Sandra, you gotta talk to this Michelle. You gotta talk to Michelle. So brilliant, well done. Ooh. That's awesome. awesome. Thank you. That's that's what you got out of this night. It was a great tip. So yeah. thank you, Emily, for asking it. You're, you're very welcome. Drew, if you had a question, what would your question be, Drew? Drew McDonald. Hang on. Okay, yeah. Well, listen, I'm really interested, Perm Drop, in, on how you use your space. You're standing up, you're doing, it allows you to stand back and, and use your uh, hands and you like to talk with your hands. Um, you, you, you're, if, uh, you must have some acting experience because you use the upstage and the uh, downstage area 
Um, uh, you don't let your surroundings upstage you. And uh, it, it just, I think, um, the way you bring uh, this dynamic, this physical dynamic to the combined box of the Zoom that I find very interesting. I, I came in the trail end of one of your presentations a, a month ago or so, and I've been talking about it uh, since I told Carter that uh, you should come in to observe this because he's dead when he does his presentation. And uh, I hope to emulate that uh, um, amongst other things. Thank you. Oh, Drew, we're all learning. We're all learning. Oh. Tonight. When I started, Drew, I was sitting down when the pandemic started. And then it was, I hate to say this, it was Richard Mulholland who gave us a, we, we brought him in to do a session on Zoom. And he gave a session and he said, mate, you've got to stand up. Because when you stand up, you project energy. So when I started, I was sitting down. And it, it's also, if we weren't in the pandemic and I was there in person, I wouldn't dream of sitting down and presenting to you, would I? So why would I? Because I just think my energy and my voice would mm -hmm. be able to. So no, I haven't done acting, Drew, but that's very, very kind of you. Yeah, it was the question, okay. yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, no, I've, I've never, I've never, although, although I am, on IMB, IMDB, because when I was in Cape Breton, weirdly, weird story, uh, for another time, I appeared in a movie called uh, Werewolf, and that movie was a TIFF movie, and all you can see is my arm in the movie, but I am in the credits, and uh, that, that was a weird story, so no, but I've not done acting, but thank you, I'm really glad you're enjoying it. So Drew, if you do one thing differently, if you are presenting, I would advise you to stand. Uh, and Michelle, you're a teacher by trade. So standing, yeah, so standing is more natural. It is, and you just have more control, more flow, and I'm showing you respect, I'm showing you that, that, and I can move my arms around, and yeah, thank you, Drew. I'm really glad you noticed that, thank you. Thank you. Kyle, you've not, Kyle Matthews, have we asked you for a question yet, Kyle? Uh, no, not yet. Well, now's your chance, now's your chance. Yeah, I was trying to think of, uh, of a good one. Um, I guess we, uh, my, my business actually, we're, uh, we've applied for the Volta pitch competition coming up in May. And would you suggest standing for that as well? I'm assuming it's digital or is that going to be in person? I, I didn't actually get uh, a confirmation on that. I think it'll be digital. I think, I don't know. I think it'll be digital. I, find the style that works best for you. And, and, and it's all about Drew. It's like, it's sometimes starting people when they're sitting, they project a lot of gravitas. Uh, you know, I've seen Barack Obama speak sitting and standing. No, I've seen him I've, on YouTube and YouTube. I've seen him and, you know, there's no, no, no loss of charisma, whether he's standing or sitting, it, it makes no difference, you know. So find the style that works for you. Um, what, I, I was at a dinner once and people were introducing themselves at this dinner and everyone's introducing themselves and this one person stood up to present, to introduce themselves to everybody else sitting down. That was just weird. That was really weird. Yeah. That was weird. So um, context, context. So if everybody else I, I, in a restaurant is sat down and you decide to stand up to, you know, everyone's introduced themselves, hi, my name's Kojo, hi, my name's Drew. And then Kyle stands up and says, hi, my name's, that's just weird. So context. So um, if you- it, it definitely is more difficult to, I don't want to use, say be charismatic but it, it you've i kind of feel uh like my public speaking ability is not as good in front of a like sitting at my kitchen table in front of my laptop than it would be if we were oh, it won't be absolutely won't be kyle it won't be because your voice projection um everything is more relaxed when you're sitting down you relax and uh, relaxing and projecting energy are uh, at the opposite ends of the spectrum so you can't relax and project energy so yeah, I, I would, if, if it works for you, I would stand. If you can do what Michelle's doing as well, which is to have the brands behind her. Wow, that is awesome. That is awesome. Yeah, it, it, no, it, it, does, it does convey, does convey messages. So we are sadly out of time, but the good news is this was part one of three. So I hope you can all join us next week when we are gonna be talking about Pixar and the art of storytelling. So we've gone from language 
And I do want you to think, just spend 10, 15 minutes thinking about how you want your audience to think, feel and act. And therefore, what words you need to use. Michelle, I'm thrilled that you have been able to practice and, and the reaction you saw from Carl. Thank you so much, Carl. That was so generous of you and, and, and great. Awesome. Awesome. So, Emily, thank you as always. Drew, very, very kind of you. Ariane, always good to see you. Looting, um, I hope you enjoyed it and I hope we'll see you next week. Michelle, thank you for all your great comments. Carl, thank you for being so generous and for being so supportive of everybody else. Simon, always, 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 always great to see you. Thank you so much. Bill, I had one thing if you don't yeah yeah so don't mind yeah um i was just thinking it would be a good exercise to try to pitch something completely different than what we're than our companies and what we're used to pitching try to take something else yeah, maybe yeah. something that's super mundane and boring and try to pitch yeah, it yeah so um, you could do that you could, excitement. that you could do that the reason i don't like that just just the reason i don't like that is um it's like when you learn to drive a car. If I say I want to teach you how to drive a car in a uh, in a in a van, and then you're going to drive a mini. So I, I I think there is something to that. But I think you know, let's just do the real thing, and then see if you can transfer those skills over to other things. But I I, I don't think that's a bad idea. And what I'll do is because of the time, if we have the time, I think that'd be really good exercise. And do you know what, Simon? I'm going to try it. I'm actually going to try it. I'm going to try it. Let's see how. Let's see if it works. Let's try it. Let's try yeah. it. So uh, thank you. I, I might try as well. No, we should. We should. So uh, Luting, thank you very much. Bill, thank you for your question and your enthusiasm. Paula, thank you, thank you, thank you. I really, really appreciate it. Anamika, thank you so much for your very kind comments, which I really look forward to reading. Um, and thank you, thank you, thank you. Michelle, it was great to have you with us. Ali Reza, hopefully I'll see you in person next time. Hopefully I'll see you in person. And, and Chandra, thank you very much. There you are, Paula. There you are. Yeah, there you are. And Jordi Mott, Jordi, I hope I get to see you in person uh, next time. And Z Sandra Beasy Rap, uh, love the name, love the name, Sandra Beasy Rap, just love the name. And hope to see you in person next time. So, Erin, uh, if you could stay on for a couple of minutes afterwards, yep. I'll, that'd be great. No problem. Everybody else, Thank you, I, bid you, I bid you farewell. Thank Bye. you, everyone. See you Thank next you. week. Next week, same time. Woohoo!